Okay, hey everyone. My name is Max, and uh, I also go by the name Angie Wizard. And I have traveled more than 5,000 miles to come here to you guys and tell you one important thing. I have an addiction. Yeah, I'm actually addicted to reading a source code, in particular, Angular sources. And you know what? Over time, I have come to a conclusion that it's not such a bad thing. In fact, it can be greatly beneficial, and I'm about to prove it to you today. My hope is that after this talk, Angular repository will get at least an extra 1,000 forks. So we'll see. OK, what are we going to talk about today? We will be talking about Angular modules. And the thing about them is that sometimes they are confusing. <laughs> well, maybe not that confusing, of course, but <clears throat> when I first started to use them in non-trivial scenarios, I found a few things puzzling. For example, we all know that we have encapsulation for components and templates. However, there is no encapsulation for dynamic components and providers. Okay. Uh, we all know that we can import models, modules into other modules. However, there is no module hierarchy between them. And most tutorials can make you think that eager and lazy loaded modules are different types, when in reality, they are exactly the same. And I will show it to you today. All right, let's get started. Now, I don't think that modules should be confusing, right? And to me, the best way to clear confusions is to learn how things work under the hood. So today, I'm taking you on a journey into the internals of Angular modules. We will learn the relationship between modules and injectors. Specifically, I will show you how modules are converted into injectors. And I will do that by telling you about my experience reverse engineering Angular modules. I did that while working on an extension mechanism for a plugin-based application. So I'll also share with you some insights today about uh, building an extensible platform with Angular. OK? Now, the application I worked on is similar to a diagram designer. So we have a bunch of widgets in a toolbox, and each widget has its own behavior and properties. And then to draw a diagram, we simply drop a widget on a canvas. Now, where this application is interesting is that the default set of widgets can be extended with widgets implemented by third-party developers, which basically makes the application a platform. OK, this diagram illustrates the relationship between a platform and extension modules. So developers implement widgets as Angular components, and then they package them in Angular modules. These modules, according to Angular documentation, can be classified as feature widget modules. However, I refer to them simply as extension modules. OK, so the most difficult task when working on this application was the implementation of the extension mechanism. Specifically, the question that I asked myself was how to load and render widgets implemented by third-party developers. Now, let me show you why it was challenging. And to do that, I will use Angular Material Library as an example. So uh, this is how we import, how we extend our applications with the library, right? We simply import an extension module with required widgets, and then we can use these widgets in our component templates, right? There are two important things to note here. First is that we know exactly which widgets are provided by an extension module, correct? So in this case, it's the button widget. And second, since we import these modules explicitly, we know exactly which modules will be used as part of our application. However, in the case of the application I was working on, all this information was missing. Angular, the developers can put as many widgets as they like in an extension module. And there is no information beforehand which widgets are provided by an extension module. And second, each widget can have its own server-side implementation. Uh, and so it has to be deployed to a server first. So the list of extension modules and widgets 
is generated on the server and then can be fetched with an API request. So there is no information about which extension modules to load until after the application has bootstrapped. It means that every single extension module would need to be loaded lazily. OK, so these are the challenges that I faced. And what do you do Sorry, when you face a difficult challenge? I don't know about you guys, but I usually take a vacation. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. However, this is not how I spent it. I was actually debugging the router implementation. And why router? Well, because if you think about it, it solves similar tasks. First, it doesn't know which routes are provided by routing module, yet it still needs to somehow retrieve them. And second, sometimes it needs to lazy load a module, right? So basically, I could map this process to my own use case. It's that just instead of routes, an extension module would provide widgets. So let's see what I found there. This gist demonstrates what the router does to lazy load the module and retrieve the routes from it. And I have removed all the irrelevant stuff and ended up with just four lines of code. However, there is so much information here. Let's go step by step. So first, it lazy loads a module class, then it compiles it, and get some module factory. Then this factory is used to create a module instance and an injector. And then the router uses this injector to retrieve the routes. Now, if you're looking at this code for the first time, it probably doesn't make much sense to you. And it didn't much make sense to me either. But don't worry, because right now we'll explore the concepts involved in each of these steps. And we'll start with the module factory. I personally came across this concept when exploring the contents of the ng folder generated by Angular JIT compiler. You can see this folder for yourself if you open the sources tab in the developer tools, right? There it sits with module and component factories inside. After debugging a little bit more, I found the ng module compiler that takes a module class and generates a module factory. What is this factory? Well, basically, it's just a set of provider definitions with relevant metadata-like dependencies. Let me give you an example. Suppose we have two classes, A and B, and both of these classes are used as providers uh, in a module. So here, B class injects an instance of an A class in the constructor. So basically, B depends on A, right? When Angular generates a factory, it reflects this dependency in the metadata, right? You can see here that the B provider depends on A. And that's it. That's what makes this module factory. And if we get back to the router implementation, it's the second statement that takes a module class, compiles it, and gets a module factory. The next statement shows how this factory is used to create an instance of a module. And it basically call create method on it and pass in a parent injector. What's interesting is that when Angular creates an instance of a module, it also creates an instance of an injector that holds the providers defined by a module. And we can access this injector through the injector property. And that's exactly what the router does, right? It takes this injector and retrieves the routes that are registered as providers on a module. OK, so let's recap what we've learned. Right? We have a module class, then we compile it either using JIT or ahead of time compiler. We get a module factory, and then in runtime, we call create method, and we get an instance of a module and an injector. Okay, if you're looking at this diagram and asking yourself if every module in Angular gets its own factory, it's exactly the question that I asked myself. Let's find out. So here I have two modules, A and B, and they are imported into the main app module. This module is uh, compiled when Angular bootstraps. So can you guess how many factories are going to be there? Right, 
If you guess correct, exactly, we get only one factory. And that's because Angular creates factories only for modules that are being compiled. It doesn't create factories for the imported modules. However, the providers from the imported modules are merged. So if you take a look at the factory, you can see that the providers from the A and B imported modules sit there. Incidentally, it also includes provider definitions for the imported module classes to make them injectable. So what we've just learned is that no matter how many modules you import, after the compilation and when Angular bootstraps, you're still going to have only one single factory and single injector. And now that we know that, let's get back to the common confusions that we started with and take a look at them again. So I told you that there is no uh, encapsulation for dynamic components and providers, right? And that's because after the compilation, you don't have several modules. You have only one single factory and an injector. And during the compilation, the compiler cannot know where and how you will be using dynamic components and providers, right? So it cannot control encapsulation. Also, you learned today that there is no module hierarchy between imported modules. Right? And again, it's because we don't have several modules. And the last thing, eager is the same as lazy. So I told you that eager lazy, loaded modules and lazy loaded modules are exactly the same. And it's true because every eager and lazy loaded both modules goes through the same process of compilation and instantiation. OK. So, Let's get back to our original question that we started with, how to load and render widgets implemented by third-party developers, right? And take a look at the process. As you might expect, it will be quite similar to what the router does. So we load a module class, and then we compile it and get a module factory. Interestingly, this particular piece of the process can be optimized by first compiling a module class during the build time using a head of time compiler, and then loading this factory directly to the browser. Once we have a factory, what do we do with it? We use it to create a module instance and injector, right? We call create method and we get an injector. And if you ever wondered what is lazy loading, it's exactly these steps. And they are not different to how an eager module is compiled and instantiated. OK, once we have an injector, we can follow in the step footsteps of the router and retrieve our widgets. But first, these widgets have to be registered on a module, correct? So again, let's take a look at the, what the router does. And we can follow in these footsteps. So as you all know, the router has static methods for root and for child. And under the hood, these methods simply register the route definitions as providers using the specific token routes. So we can do the same, right? Here, I have one extension module with one widget implemented as component A1, and I'm registering it on the module using the widgets token. And as a value, I pass in a widget definition. That includes a component that implements the widget and the widget's name. Once this module is compiled and we get an injector out of it, we can use this token widgets to retrieve the list of all the widgets provided by an extension module. OK. Now we've covered everything we need to know before we take a look at the actual code. And let's do it right now. So this is how we load a module class. Then we compile it and get a module factory. And we use it factory to create an instance of a module and an injector. Now then we use this injector to retrieve the, wid the list of widgets. And now we need to render it, right? We haven't talked about rendering yet. And since uh, widgets implemented as Angular components and loaded lazily, 
they need to be rendered as dynamic components. And the topic of dynamic components rendering is quite broad on its own. I will not cover much details now. If you're interested, however, you can attend my workshop tomorrow on DOM manipulations. I'll be talking in depth about DOM manipulations, including dynamic components rendering. So for now, it's important to know that you can use a component factory to create an instance of a component and render it. So here's the actual code. Right, I'm using component factory resolver to get a component factory and then pass it into a view container which initiates and renders this component. I want you all to take a second now and appreciate how much you can learn by debugging and reverse engineering. And maybe next time when you're feeling stuck, working on a difficult task, you can find the courage inside to take a dive into the sources and find some helpful ideas. And to help you with that, I started Angular in Depth publication. I started it with the goal to explain how things work under the hood in Angular. I was lucky to have other authors join me in this quest. So today, Angular in Depth is the publication for the most challenging topics about Angular and related technologies. Incidentally, just a few days ago, we reached our first one million views. Thank you. So if you're not one of our readers yet and want to become an expert in Angular, I definitely recommend that you check it out. OK, so I have put together a sample application that demonstrates how to implement this extension mechanism that I've been talking about. Put it on GitHub. Here's the link. Check it out. I have also written a few articles on dynamic components rendering and common confusions with modules. Again, here are the links. Do check them out. OK, and the last thing. Wise men say that truth lies within. And in case of Angular, it's within the Angular sources. So don't be afraid to read them and find the truth. However, always remember that nothing stays the same. <laughs> Thank you for your attention and good luck.